Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 5 of the course on human behavior. So this lecture will be focused on something called perception and so what I will do is as I have been following in the last 4 lectures, I will start with a little recap of what we did in the earlier classes and then we will get on with the business of uh, making you understand what perception is. For starters, let me start by a definition of what perception is. So perception is making meaning of the external stimuli which the sensory organs are grabbing and sending to the brain. That is what perception is. So what the sense organs actually see are colors or light which is reflected from some object. So at the best the sense organs can detect this and tell the brain that they can see colors, they can see form and they can see objects foreground and background. It is the job of the brain to collect these informations about angles, about lines, about foreground and background, about colors, about brightness and uh, darkness and based on that comprising these informations and making the meaning that is a tree, something is a tree and something is a person. So perception is that function of the brain which integrates information from sensation to make a meaning. But before we jump into what perception is, let us go back a little and see what we did in the last 4 lectures. We started off by telling why do we need this course, how do we study human behavior and explaining what is human behavior, what is the need of study of human behavior. So we started off by telling that human behavior is necessary because in all situations we are humans and we want to study humans. So the only science or the science which actually helps us understand human behavior is psychology. So this course is more about psychology, why do we need to study human behavior? Well, the answer is because everybody wants to study what other people would react to, how other people react to, what they do, why they do, when they do and things like that. At the core of all this function is the idea that people want to control and that is the one power that people want. If you can control other people, it was be a nice world. So you can control inanimate objects but you cannot control human beings. And so that is that's the idea why should we be studying human behavior. And the other important thing being that humans are unpredictable and so using a science of psychology we can study what people do and how they do and when we can predict what they do and how to do we can have a better grip of the situation and can have much meaningful interactions with them. So we started off there by starting up and giving up definitions of what psychology is and what does it do and how it does it. Then we went on to look at a little bit of history of how psychology started and there we pointed out that psychology started from two branches, one with the philosophy and the other is physiology and how these two branches combine together to actually form the science of psychology. Then we moved on to explaining some basic questions in psychology which is the nature nurture debate and some other uh, basic debates that we did there. Further to that we explain some schools of psychology. So we started off by uh, looking at the schools of structuralism, functionalism, gestaltism, psychoanalysis and behaviorism. So what are these schools actually? So when we, when we talk about structuralism, it talks about human behavior in terms of basic structures. So human behaviors can be broken down into basic structures. The reason why the school was proposed was people who proposed this school, they came from basic sciences of physics and physiology and they wanted to study human behavior as they would study atoms and molecules. And so human behavior they believe can be broken down into, into its parts and can be studied. Contrary to this view was the view of functionalism where human behavior was explained in terms of adaptiveness of a behavior. So you, how do you study human behavior? You can only see a human behavior or study human behavior when it is actually going on and so you cannot be breaking, breaking depth into parts. Then came the idea of behaviorism which says that 
if you want to study human behavior, you have to see how many times a particular stimulus gives a particular response, how human beings respond to certain situations and if you can do that for a n number of time, you will come up with an optimal response and thus make a prediction that if a particular stimulus appears, human beings will do a particular kind of a response. For example, if somebody kicks you, you will become angry is a relational thing. It has nothing to do with mind, brain, soul and those kind of things. So, it is a simple stimulus response function. Then came the idea of Gestalt school which actually talked about that human behavior is not about uh, looking at behavior as part and whole. So, if you want to study human behavior, you have to study human behavior as wholes and parts which basically means that a single behavior and parts of the behavior cannot be combined into one. Also human behaviors could be studied in terms of organization principles that they proposed. And lastly, we had the psychoanalysis school which said that most behavior comes from unconscious urges that people have. Further to that, we looked at some newer schools of uh, psychology or newer met, uh, uh, approaches to psychology and these were uh, the psycholinguistics, the neuropsychology, the idea about uh, cognitive neuroscience and so on and so forth. And that was the end of the first lecture and so in continuation to that we had the second lecture where we actually looked at some viewpoints from which a human behavior could be studied. So, a particular human behavior can be studied from a number of viewpoints starting from the behavioral viewpoint to the cognitive viewpoint to the subjective viewpoint to the psychoanalytical viewpoint and so on and so forth. And that is what we did in those, those, that lecture. Further to that, we expanded our study there or we expanded our lecture there and I explained to you how do we do research in uh, human behavior in human psychology and that I explain in terms of something called experimentation, something called correlational research, literature reviews, uh, in terms of observations and in terms of modeling and, and a number of other uh, ways of doing research in human or research on humans. The last two lectures were focused on sensation where we looked at how the physical world and the psychological world interact with each other. In the physical world, we have things which are physical in nature. For example, we have temperature, we have pressure, we have uh, light photons, we have air pressure which, are, which is uh, creating the audition and so on and so forth. So, how these uh, objects or how these elements actually get converted into something which humans can read and that was the topic of the last, uh, uh, the third lecture. So, the third lecture we looked at how the sensory organs take these physical information and convert it into something which the brain can study and make meaning out of it. We started off by looking at what are the problems which any sensory organs would face and then we looked at the characteristics of any sense organs and there we defined two factors, one is called sensitivity and the other is called sensory coding. Sensitivity is how accurate your sensory system is or any detection system is and we looked at two basic parameters of any sensitivity of a system which is the absolute threshold and the differential threshold. Further to that, we looked at how errors are marked in these sensory systems using a theory of signal detection. Then we focused on to something called sensory coding which is how the biological uh, functions or how the biological system encodes the sensory information which is passed on from the uh, sensory systems. We also looked at how complexity and in intensity of a physical stimulus is encoded by the sensory system. Further to that, we took a model sensory organ which is the eye and then dissected it to look at how does the eye create vision, how does the eye encode information from the external environment and create it to vision. So, that was what we did up till now in the past four lectures. Once the information is passed on from the sensory organ and is coded through the biological mechanisms, a meaning has to be generated out of it and that is where the idea of perception comes in. Perception is making meaning out of sensory, uh, sensory stimuluses or making me meaning out of information which is passed on from the sensory stimuluses. So, organization of those sensory stimuluses into meaningful bits is what is perception. Before we start perception, let me tell you a little story for why we do we need to study perception first of all. So, there is this famous case where these two hunters uh, were actually uh, venturing into uh, wild uh, life and they were spending the night there. So, it was night and they had their camp made out and uh, they were enjoying the night and they were looking for bears uh, which they can shoot. And so, it was, it was 
nearly dusk, not actually night, nearly dusk. And so in that point of time, they were talking to each other. They were partially intoxicated and uh, they heard a shrill noise. When they heard a shrill noise and at this point of time they were very far away from their camp. So when they heard the shrill noise, one of the hunters, actually both of the hunters picked up their gun and they shot in the direction of the shrill noise. They thought it was a bear which was actually morning and the idea was to shoot this bear. As soon as they shot from their gun a bullet, they heard a shrill human noise, a shrill human cry for help. They rushed to that direction from where the, uh, the tent was and where they actually shot in the direction in which they shot. And when they actually went near the tent, they saw that another uh, hunter, which was in the, near, in the near, nearby neighborhood, was actually shot by the bullet. How can that be possible? They did see a bear in the low light of the dusk. What they saw was a bear which was approaching and grilling and making terrible sounds. So they shot. So the question was, both of these people were then tried for murder. And when uh, the, the case went into the, uh, the court, what happened is that all evidences were collected. Now, as an evidence, it was found out that the, both the shots actually passed the tent, but one of the shots hit the person and the other uh, shot cleanly passed through the tent. The question was, how can these people imagine a yellow tent to be a bear? It was very difficult to explain this that how can it be possible that this people who know their tent very well, they were away from the tent but in the light of the dusk, how can they imagine the tent to be a bear? The jury didn't believe it and one of the person was convicted. Years later, it was explained how the perceptual system can actually fool us. So with the light intensity decreasing and with the level of intoxication that they have, it was fairly possible to see the tent as a bear and they hitting the tent or they trying to save their life with the gun. And so years later, uh, these kind of explanations are provided and the person who actually had spent some years in jail, he was given some relief or he was let, uh, he was let go of uh, the jail. This is what perception is all about. This is what perception is. At times, you actually see things that don't exist. You make meaning of things that don't exist. But why are all these errors? And how these all errors actually uh, begin? So before we begin with this perception uh, chapter, I'll show you some illusions. I'll show you some slides here. And I'll maybe give you some time to see what you see. And I'll show to you that what you see with your eyes is not what is presented to you and that is what perception is all about and then I'll explain how does the perception process work. So ready for it? Let's go. So as you can see, this is a funny picture. Here is a cat and here is a mirror and when the cat sees the mirror, sees a tiger. This is what perception is all about. As you can see the headline, what it says is the process of organizing and interpreting information which enables us to recognize meaning full objects is what the event is. So although the cat actually in the mirror is the cat, but what the cat is perceiving is that it is a tiger and this is what perception is all about. So powerful is the idea of perception. Let's see something else. This is called the Herman grid. Now we have seen this grid in the last lecture on sensation. So what I ask you to do is to move from this direction and this direction onwards, your eyes. As you do that, you will see that in between this area, at this area you will see graying out, which means that you no more see a white color, but you see smudges of gray color. Why is this happening? Remember the explanation that I gave you in the chapter on sensation and there I said why this happens is because how the cones and rods are actually uh, located on your retina and that is one reason why when you quickly move from this area to this area, you see the smudges. Let us go to a third figure. Now obviously this is the best figure to look at and when you do that, once you focus on this figure, you see that things are moving and believe me, they are not. So the idea of motion that happens here is because it is an illusion and if you try focusing yourself at the center of these 
So these are the center where you try focusing yourself for longer periods of time. What will happen is the motion disappears. So the motion happens because there is a stimulus is presented in such a way that it creates virtual motion on you and see that is the power of perception that things that do not exist actually start existing. It is not only with figures that perception can happen, it can happen with a lot of things. Now this is an interesting thing to look at. Focus your eyes in the middle plus. If you do that after a period of time what you will see is you will not see these moving violet figures, but you will see a single green figure which is moving. Can you do that? I am pretty sure most of you would be seeing that and then this is alternating. So sometimes you see the green figure, a single green ball which is moving and then at other times you see the violet ball which is moving. That is the power of what perception can do. Let us look at this, what do you see? And most people are going to tell me that what they see are two triangles one over the other. There is a black triangle and on top of the black triangle is a white triangle, correct? Wrong. These are not two triangles. What I see is three angles in black and three balls which have a section cut off, uh, cut off of it and placed in the right direction and that is why there is this imaginary triangle in white that you see and then you believe that this white triangle is actually covering the black triangle, is not that what is happening? But then if you look into it, the perceptual system is making meaning of it when there is no meaning to start with. It is not only with figures that you actually see these illusions or perceptual illusions happen or perceptual inconformity happens. There are other written uh, things or written documents where you see perception. Let us look at this and try to read it. Simple, a bird in the hand. Now what most people miss is there are two the. If you look into it, there is one here and there is other other here and it is very conveniently that people miss one the and the organization or the reading is so uh, the, the, the ability of reading is, is so developed in humans that you do not see one of these until and unless I point it out to you. Interesting one and the best one, look at this, it is a good example of a brain study. Now if you can read this, you have a strong mind and most of us can. Here you cannot read, here you cannot read, here you cannot read until you come to this thing. Now it is proof how your mind can do amazing things impressive things in the beginning it was hard but now on this line your mind is reading it automatically with our even thinking about without thinking about so without thinking about it because be proud only because certain people can only read this please forward if you can read this. Amazing, right? Now if you look into it, there is nothing, uh, there is nowhere where you can find sentences, but you can read it. Amazing, isn't it? And that is what perception can do. So let us start our idea of what perception is and how does it really function? What is the way in which perception functions? So before we go into the idea of perception or the five functions of perception, let me tell you what is the need of perception at all. What is the need of making meaning of stimuluses which actually come to us? Now if I was a small flower, if I was a daffodil, the only thing that I wanted from life was to know where my roots are going, where my leaves are going, how big it is, where are the nutrients in, where is the water and those kind of questions which are there. And so these are pretty simple questions. So if I was a flower or if I was a bird, these are the questions that I actually need. But most human beings are not birds and they are complex in nature and that most of us will agree. And so for that matter, human beings, since they are complex in nature, they have four or five functions or at least four functions that I can think of, which is different from most simple organisms. And so what are these four functions? One of these functions is that human beings are mobile, they move. The human beings can locomote, 
right? But flowers cannot. And since they can locomote, they have to navigate through places and directions and, and cities and, and all kind of things, environments. Once they, once they are required to that, do that, perceptual systems are required because this perceptual system will tell them where to go and where not to go. If these systems are not present, then human beings will keep on falling down, keep on uh, going into ob running into obstacles and will never be able to uh, pass on or never be able to navigate directions. So, one of the primary functions of human beings which is different from bird, birds or animals or plants or flowers is that they can move. The second function is that human beings manipulate. Now, human beings manipulate symbols to make meaning. For example, when you are at any point of time when you are reading something, you are doing something, there are lots of symbols around us. There are symbols of currency, there are symbols of uh, at, uh, at attention or uh, uh, are, are the symbols of direction, there are symbols of uh, things like several things. If you look around the world, there are lots of symbols and at any point of time, we look at these symbols and they make meaning to us. So, uh, human beings, they make meaning of symbols and interpret these and then they go around their uh, everyday work. Now, in terms of manipulation, human beings also manipulate objects around them. For example, if you are sitting in a car, you manipulate the wheel. If you are uh, walking, you manipulate your leg. If you are riding a bicycle, you manipulate something else. And so, human beings do a lot of manipulation. So, not only human beings are mobile, they are also, they also manipulate at, at different functions and they, you know, human beings also use symbols and make decisions based on the symbols. For example, if there is a red light, it is a symbol that do not cross. If it is a green light, there is a symbol that you cross. If it is an orange light, it gives you invitation to pass till the point of time that it turns into or pass slowly. There are symbols in driving, there are symbols everywhere. And so, the third function that human beings are uh, uh, prone to is understanding symbols and make meaning out of it. And the fourth thing is that human beings execute plans. Human beings based on their capacities, they execute a number of plans. They make complex plans and not only they make complex plans, they execute it. So, for example, cooking dinner to, uh, tonight. Now, for that I have to make a plan of getting something from the market, then how do we uh, uh, make it, what temperature should the oven be, where I should be putting it, where should be hot, should be cold, how many people to call, not to call, that kind of a thing. And so, human beings actually make plan. And so, that is one of the four functions that human beings do. And because of that, they are different from smaller organisms. And for all these functions to actually go through, for all these functions to take place, it is believed there are two group of scientists which believe that the information from sensation is more than enough. Now, on one level, we have someone called J. J. Gibson. So, before we come to the five functions, there is the need to explain why these five functions, how these five functions come about. So, we have two classes of theories which believe why perception is necessary or how perception really functions, what is necessary. So, one, the one theory is called the Gibsonian theory and what Gibsonian theory actually tells is that the light which is following onto the retina has enough information and this 2D structure, this 2D information on the retina is more than enough for human beings to do whatever they want to do, to achieve whatever they want to achieve. Now, this theory is called the theory of ecological optics and the theory of ecological optics says that the retina, the light falling on the retina has enough information. And that is how they believe that pilots actually make decisions of landing, turning around and things like that. So, you do not need to use your brain, the information which is coming onto the retina from the sensory organs, that is enough for making all kind of manipulations, making plans, doing decisions and so on and so forth. Opposition to that are a group of psychologists who says that no, it is more than enough. It is not more than enough. Human beings at all point of time need an updated image of the world around them or a model of the environment, an updated model of the environment. So, human beings are not only dependent on static information which is falling on their eye, they need an updated information of the environment around us or for, the, for them to create a model of the environment and based on this model, they do what they do. They make meaning of the world around us and that makes them do primary functions. So, what does this theory actually say? This theory says that, so it is, it is called uh, <coughs> the updated, it is not actually called the updated in, information, but I will 
state is as the update environment theory and so what this theory says is that human beings need two information for an updated view of the environment around us. First is information from sensory organs. So, human beings for creating a model of the environment around us, a model which is being updated at all points of time need two bits of information. The first information is information which is coming from the sensation. So, Gibsonian view or the Gibsonian idea. So, all information which is coming from the physical environment falling onto the sensory organs is what human beings need. Other than that, they also need certain assumptions. So, for perception to fu function, human beings not only need information from sensations, they also need certain assumptions. Assumptions like birds fly, assumptions like lizards are mostly on the roof, assumptions like the roof is always on the top, assumptions like a door will mostly open on the outside, these kind of assumptions. So, certain assumptions that fishes will always swim in water. And these kind of assumptions are necessary for human beings to make perceptions because if fishes can fly then the whole world around us will be haywire. And so, based on these assumptions and based on certain information which is coming from sensations, uh, human beings integrate these two things and create predictions and these predictions actually are what are called perceptions. So, how do human beings perceive? Human beings mostly perceive not from just sensations but certain assumptions about the world and integrate these two together to form perception. So, what is perception then? Perception is integrating sensory information from the world with certain assumptions or beliefs that or certain uh, pre-encoded beliefs that human beings have combine them together to make meaning of the incoming stimulus in relation to the world around you. That is what perception is all about. Now, most perception generally fall into five categories and what we are going to do in this lecture and the upcoming lecture is we are going to focus ourselves onto these five categories or onto these five functions of perception. So, let us start looking at it. So, there are five functions of perception. For any perception to go through, we have five things, right. So, perception require five steps or it is a five step model. First, the first step in perception or the first thing that should happen, first event in a perceptual event is called attention. So, attention is used to make decisions about which incoming information is to be further processed and which is not. At any point of time, your eye is receiving a lot of information from the world. Dependent on your attention or attentional span, we decide what information to look at and what information not to look at. If we try taking in all the information inside us or if we try encoding all the information inside us from the sensory system, then it will not make meaning. For example, if I am driving a car, the information that I want is only looking is only at looking at the road. I do not want the information from the car radio which is coming up or from the friend who is talking uh, next to you or uh, the person next to you in another car who is honking or any other or how the wind is blowing, those kind of information is not immediate. But when the car is moving smoothly, then I can perhaps take some of this information. So, there are certain information that I do not want and certain information that I want and perception is basically deciding which information to process. So, making decisions about which incoming information is important to us. The second step in perception is the system must be able to determine where the objects are located in the external environment. The second step in perception is finding out what objects you are looking at and where these objects in the environment. Once you can find out where these objects in the environment, once you are able to locate these objects in the environment, you can perhaps separate the background from the foreground and then you can do a perceptual process or you can do perception or make meaning out of it. If you are not able to separate the background from the foreground or the figure from the ground, you would not be able to make meaning of what you are seeing and what you are not seeing, what you have to see and what you do not have to see. The third system of perception is the perceptual system may be able to determine which objects are out there in the environment. Not only we should be able to and this is called recognition this is called recognition. So, I should be able to recognize what I am seeing, I should be able to localize or locate, locate what objects are there and I should be able to attend. So, perception starts with attention, then 
localization and then recognition. Recognition is the process through which we are able to distinguish objects in the environment. So, what, what is a tree, what is a cow, what is a person and so on and so forth. If you cannot do that, what will happen is everything seems to be the same. So, that is the third step in perception. The fourth step in perception is that as I said, perception starts with not only getting information about the environment and updating them, it also works in terms of certain assumptions. We have to have you certain assumptions and these are the last two things, last two things to do. The system must be able to abstract the criteria features of a recognized object. What is meaning abstraction? So, this is called abstraction. So, when I see a particular object in the environment, I should be able to gather only those features of the object in the environment which I require. Now, what, does, what is the meaning of this? Anything that you see in the environment, so you, you perceive every day, right? So, if you are looking at a chair, now there is a model of the chair in the head, that chair should be looking like this and that is called the prototype. We will come to that when we explain the idea of perception. So, the prototype is an idea of a chair which is in your head or which is stored somewhere as a representation in your uh, brain. Now, once you see a chair, what features do you want to take from it is just the idea of its form and the idea of the fact that it is a chair. And when these ideas or these information gets binded up or gets thrown on to the, uh, to the brain which does a comparison and based on what you are seeing in terms of angles, lines and things like that, it makes an assumptions and also affordances, it makes an assumptions that this is a chair. So, every time you see a chair, you actually do not perceive the whole chair, you perceive parts of it. Right? Uh, for example, there is a bean bag, how do you make an idea that it is a chair? What is the function of a chair? What is the idea of a chair? A chair is something in which you sit. So, it has to have a place where you can sit and if the bean bag has a place where you can sit, which is called the affordance. So, affordance is what does the object afford or what does the object naturally seem to be like? Now, in a bean bag, there is enough space where a person can sit and that makes you believe that it is a chair or a kind of a chair. And so, this is called abstraction. Abstraction is basically looking at the external stimulus and making a very primitive model or making the very minimalistic model of what are the features or what are the uh, primary features, what are the extra features which do not exist in the prototype in your head. And the last is the perceptual system must maintain certain inherent features of the object and this is what these two things are what are called assumptions. So, this is called constancy. So, what is constancy? Constancy is maintaining certain features. For example, if there is a door and I move the door out, it still looks like a door. If I move the door in, it still looks like a door. But the angle that it is pertaining, the angle that is, uh, the door is obtaining is different on your retina but you still see a uh, door. Look at your friend, if he is coming from a distance and if he is standing in front of your distance, the image that falls in your retina of the friend are different. But then in your mind, you do not see your friend actually growing in size and decreasing in size. This is called constancy, right? You see the moon, a full moon is bigger than a part moon. And when you look at them, you do not see that the moon has changed its shape. This is called constancy. So, maintaining that assumption that moons are the top and this kind of idea is what is called constancy. So, let us go back and start with the first function of perception which is called attention and let us look at how does our attention really function. So, the first step of perception where we start is called attention. Now, what is attention first of all? Attention is a mental filter, a filter which is in your brain which the brain puts in front of the incoming stimuli so that certain stimuli can be selected and certain stimuli should uh, cannot be selected. Now, think of it as a sieve. Now, what is a sieve? Have you made tea before? Now, if you made tea before, you use a sieve, a filter for separating the tea and the tea leaves. Attention, think of attention as a thing like that. It separates what you want and what you do not want. So, those stimuli which you want or those information from the external stimulus that you want is separated by the attentional filter and those stimuli you do not want stay on the output or the output side of a filter. So, attention can be thought of as a filter. So, it is a filter like this and so all incoming information is falling on this attentional filter and this attentional filter based on certain assumptions or based on certain motivations will allow only. So, if we have R1, R2, R3, 
R4, these are the four input stimuluses which are coming in the attentional filter based on certain characteristics, certain parameters or certain requirements will only allow R3 because R3 is the information that you want or R3 is the only stimulus that you want to see. So, the study of attention concerns primarily with the cognitive resources and their limitations. What is attention? So, basically as I said this is an attentional filter and this attentional filter depends upon your cognitive resources, how much cognitive resources are there and limitations. The eye has certain limitations, the nose has certain limitations, the ear has certain limitations, it can take only certain amount of information. Now, if you remember sensation, I showed you some limitations. For example, the opponent process theory says that if you see red color, immediately you will see the green color. Right? And so, it is so it has the limitation that if I over excite the red color, then after a point of time it becomes saturated and you start seeing green. So, this is the limitation of the cone for that matter. And so, there are certain limitations with the ear also, there are certain limitations with all of the sensory organs. And so, these sensory organs, these limitations and the availability of cognitive resources decide which stimulus goes in and which stimulus does not go in and that is what attention is all about. Now, at any given period of time, people only have a certain amount of mental energy to be devoted to all possible tasks and all the incoming information confronting them. So, what attention filter is? Attention filter is how much mental resource or how much cognitive resource is available with you. The cognitive resources that people have, they get divided or they are used up by the brain for certain functions. Now, most of the cognitive resources are used for doing automatic functions. For example, maintaining heartbeat, maintaining pulse rate, you, you are not asked. The body does it on your on their own. Things like perceiving, things like uh, movement, things like thinking, they require cognitive resources as well. So, mostly 70 to 80 percent cognitive resources is dedicated to doing normal functions or functions which can keep the body alive. The 30 percent or 20 percent which is available is what is available to people and that is what they have to tap to. You have often heard the term saying that we never use 100 percent of the brain, we only use 5 percent of the brain. The reason being that or 10 percent of the brain, the reason being that the 90 percent that, that is there is used for maintaining the bodily functions. And so, within the 10 percent or 5 percent which is available, there are a lot of functions to be done. For example, walking, thinking, talking, eating and so many other things which are there. Right? And so, once those are there, only a part of the cognitive resources is left for attention to happen. So, what is happen attention? Attention is sometimes synonymously used with something called mental concentration. Remember all those days when we were sitting in a class and the teacher used to say pay attention. What does it mean? It means to concentrate, to focus on what you are doing and once you focus on what you are doing, you put all your mental energy into one work and when you do that, all of the stimuli which is in front of you, which is next to you does not get perceived or does not get recorded at all, right. So, does not get inputted at all and that is what is mental concentration. Now, I have a wonderful question here which says, does people concentration level changes with practice? And what I will do is at the end of this lecture maybe or this topic, I will tell you whether this happens or not. But let us leave this question with you, what do you think? And so, once you are viewing this lecture, what I will do is, there, there is a forum which you can go to and maybe you post answers saying that what do you think this happens, whether you can increase your concentration levels with practice. So, let us leave that question open for now. So, attention itself is of two types, you have something called selective attention and you have something called sustained attention. Mostly we deal with something called selective attention. What is selective attention? Selective attention is a process in which you focus your attention selectively to certain stimuli and not to other stimuli. Sustained attention is a process in which you put your attention for longer periods of time on selected stimuli. So, selective is when selectively you look at certain things and then you keep on moving that way. Sustained attention is putting yourself onto one piece of information or one piece of incoming information and staying there for longer periods of time. So, what is selective attention? The term selective attention refers to the fact that we usually focus out attention on one or few tasks or events rather than many. So, selective attention is the term which basically tells that what we tend to do is we focus our attention on some task and not on all tasks. We mentally focus our resources implies that we shut out or at least process less information from other competing tasks as attention researcher Hal Pressure puts it. What is attention? He says that at any given moment people's awareness encompasses 
only a tiny portion of the stimulus impinging on their sensory system. So, what is this uh, attention? So, the first step in perception is attention which means that I have to narrow down on what to look at and what not to look at. So, when I once I want to do perception or once I am doing perception since we are talking about uh, visual perception here, there are other kinds of perception only but the, the model that I am using here is called, so this is called visual, this uh, section or lecture is basically on visual perception because the most easiest to explain is visual perception. So, in terms of visual perception, the eye focusing itself on certain objects in the external environment and not the other objects is what is called perception. Good example. Now, look at these dogs and cats and can you tell me which of these dogs is possible and which of these cats is possible? The task that you do in searching it is called selective attention. So, selectively you look at this. So, there are a number of dogs and cats and then what your job is to is tell me which of the dog is possible and which of the cat is possible. Can you do that? And when you do that, what you are actually using is called selective attention. And if you say that this is the proper dog and this is the proper cat that can exist, you are right. The job that you just did is what is selective attention. You focus selectively on all these cats and dogs and compare it with mental representations of what a dog could be and what a cat could be. And so, this is not possible, this is not possible, this is not possible, this is not possible, but this is possible. And so, how did you do that? When you took these objects or you took these forms and compared it to some mental representations which is already there in your head. And that says that this is the only dog and cat possible or forms of dogs and cats which are possible. So, how do we actually read? visual perception in terms of reading that is for object perception. So, in, in terms of cats and dogs what we did was this was object perception, but when we are reading how does attention process really work or how does the eye work for that matter. Now, the process of seeing starts with visual scanning in the form of fixations which are brief periods during which the eyes are relatively stationary separated by circuits which are quick jumps of the eye from one place to another. So, how do we see? The way in which we see is that the eye focuses on subject, certain objects, stays there for a period of time and then jumps to the second object. Now, the staying period is very brief and it is called fixation and the jumping period is also very brief which is called the circuit. So, if I have, if I want to uh, focus on this object and this object has uh, or this scene has two objects maybe, what the eye does is first focuses itself on this. So, your eye will first focus on this is called the fixation and then quickly move from here to here because in between I have nothing, no information is there. And so, when once it does this jump from here to here, this is called a circuit, a circuit. And this staying at these two objects is what is called fixations. Now, the points on which the eye fixates are not random. The eye just does not fixate on anything or any information which is out there in the environment randomly. It is a calculative process, but rather are the areas of scene that contains the most information. So, uh, if, I, if I use an eye tracker and if I give you an object or if I show you a picture and monitor your eye through an eye tracker, I will see that the eye keeps on moving from one, one point to another point in a particular fashion, in a particular pre-calculated fashion. And how does it do that? It, do, it does that in a manner that it focuses itself on objects of maximum information and not focus on, on, on areas where there is no information. Now, experiments to verify this started by showing scenes of a farmyard with either a tractor and an octopus in the middle. It was found out that the eye fixations were directed earlier and more frequently to the unusual object tractor, right? So, an uh, experiment was done in which a scene was created, a farmyard scene was created and this farmyard you had a tractor and an octopus and so what happens is when I looked at eye fixations in terms of how the eye is moving, we saw that unusual objects required lesser attention than usual objects, right? Usual objects got little attention. Now, this is a good demonstration of how the eye actually looks at. If you look at this figure, now uh, this figure has certain points which has to be followed. For example, this is the one face, an object and person, a person, a person, an object here and something here and that is what it is and all these are blanks. Now, what does the eye do? This is an eye tracker. This is uh, the demonstration or the data from an eye tracker. If you look into it, the fixations are at the point of most region which I have circled out. If you look here, still it is the same way. Now, these regions 
which have no data at all, you see that no fixations are here. For most of it, the maximum fixations are here. If you look into it, and in this case also the maximum fixations are here, and this is where my faces are. Or if you look into it, this is where my most, this is the region which has the most number of fixations, which means that our theory is correct in terms of the fact that the eye fixates itself onto areas of maximum information and then it moves on and this is the kind of movement or this is an eye tracking data. So, this is an eye tracking data. Now, one of these data is from my own lab, but other data is from some other labs and so they show how the eye actually moves or make information. There is another kind of attention which is called divided attention without eye movements. Now, humans can also selectively attend to some visual stimulus without moving their eye. In experiments that demonstrate this, observers had to detect when an object occurs. On each trial, the person stares at a blank field and then sees a brief cue. A cue is basically a plus sign appearing or some kind of a stimulus appearing or some kind of a information appearing, which is uh, directing stimulus such as small arrow that directs the subject's attention whether to the left or to the right. An object is then presented either in a location indicated by the cue or the opposite location. The interval between the cue and the object is too brief for observers to move their eyes, yet they can detect the object faster in the cued location than when in the occurs in elsewhere, which basically means that if I create an, if I create a stim, uh, stimulus like this or if I create an experiment like this, in this what happens is the subjects are asked to first look at the center of the screen which has a plus sign. Later on what will happen is certain objects will appear, right. So, maybe the object is a bell or an object is a dog or so on and so forth. Maybe this is a dog and so it has a tail, this is the mouth and so on and so forth. So, these objects will appear. Now, what will happen is there are two conditions. In one condition, what will happen is after seeing the plus, you may see a star here and as soon as you see the star here, the object in this case, the bell appears here. This is case number one. In case number two, what will happen is you see a star here, but the bell appears somewhere here. Now, if an experiment like this is done, so you start with a plus sign, then a Q appears and in terms of the Q, in one case, the Q where the cue appears or where this signal appears, you see the object there or sometimes you see it opposite. Now, experiments reveal that when the cue was presented, the object that you want to see or you see is presented in terms of where the cue is appearing, people responded it faster and then when it was in opposite direction, which basically means that they did have divided attention. So, they did see this object in the opposite direction, but the response time was slower, which means that people can see multiple objects or they have something called divided attention. So, this was about the first step that is called attention in which we focus ourselves onto certain objects and how do we read certain objects. The second step as we saw is which object, where in the, where in the external environment is the object and this term is called localization. So, what is localization? Localization of information in the external environment is essential for solving the following problems. Why do we need localization? As I said, the second step in perception is localization, which means how, how do we know what objects are there and uh, not, not what objects are there, rather that is the third step. The second step is where are the objects in the external environment. First step is recognizing that there is that, that or, or basically filtering what you want to see and the second step is locating where in the external environment are these objects. So, why do we need localization? The answer is navigating our view through the event cluttered environment. We need this localization because human beings navigate through cluttered environments and if they can locate objects in the external environment, they can pass through complex environments or they can navigate through complex environments and do their day to day work. So, localization is an important part because localization helps human beings move in complex environments, do complex things in environments by the uh, information which is provided to the sense organs and using this information and certain assumptions to find out what is there in the external environment and where they are in related to where this person is. Think of it in terms of the map. 
when you see a map you can see things around you and once you do that you are able to navigate it. So, localization is important because it helps in navigating people. Also grasping objects, navigation is important or localization is important because it helps you in grasping objects or touching objects. If there is an object in front of you and if you cannot see where it is you will be fumbling around. So, when you want to grasp certain objects or when you want to reach certain objects hold them in hand, reach them, reach to them or in any interaction with an external object the or the thing that you require is called localization. So, what is localization? It is achieved by first separating the objects from one another and then separating each from the background. So, there are two steps in localization. First, separate objects among themselves. So, if there are two objects, if I have a scene like this and in this I have a person and a dog, the first step, this is my dog, it is not very good drawing, but then you have to bear with me. So, if I have a person and dog in an in a external environment, the first step in localization is separating the person from the environment. So, the first step is I have a man and a dog and the next step is looking at these forms and separating it from the environment which is or the background which is this frame. So, this first step is recognizing that there are two objects, the third, the second step is recognizing the two objects is on a white frame or is on a white object that is the two steps which are there. So, how does the separation of objects happen? It happens in terms of figure and background. So, what is this figure and background separation? Now, the most elementary form of perceptual organization is that in a stimulus with two or more distinct regions. We usually see part of it as figure and part of it as background. Now, if I have an object like this right and so again if I have this dog right. So, these are the legs of the dog and this is the tail, this is the mouth and eyes. So, if I have a dog like this the idea of what is a dog and what is not is that anything inside this the colored area is what is the dog and whatever is white is not a dog and this separation is important because the outline which is filled in green is what the dog is and whatever is in white is not the dog. So, this separation is important and this is called separating the figure from the background. So, once we do that anything which is green filled in it is called the dog. So, this line this dark line that I have drawn green color is what is the dog and anything outside of it is called the background. So, this is my figure and this is what is called the background. This is how separation of objects are done. Now, the region seen as figure contains the object of interest. This the figure contains the object of interest which appears more solid than the ground and appears in front of it. So, this dog appears in front of the white surface and that is why it is called the figure and the white surface is called the background. The ground is the region that appears to be behind the figure. So, this is the ground it is behind this dog and that is why it is called the background. Figure background relationships. Look at this. What do you see? Now, it is called a reversible image and it is very easy to see. Now, if you consider the black as the background. The moment you think the black is the background which means that this figure if I draw like this is a cutout and once that is there this figure is a cutout you see two people staring at each other. Can you see the two people staring at each other? These are the nose, this is the mouth and this is what is all about. But the moment we see the white as the background and black as the figure you see a vase. So, this is basically if black is the background you see two faces and if white is the background you see a vase. This is called a reversible image. Can you see the vase and the two uh, faces which are seeing each other? Yes, that is what is perception all about and that is called localization or separating the figure from the background. Let us look a second one. Look at this. What do you see? Again keeping the black as the background or white as the background there are two figures. If we keep black as the background uh, foreground sorry and uh, white as the background you see a person who is actually playing a saxophone. 
can you see the person this is the nose this is the form of the body and this is my saxophone which is there but if i change so if i if if i make white as the background i see a person playing a saxophone correct but if the moment i say black is the background i see a woman a face of a woman can you see the face of a woman these are the two eyes this is the nose this is the mouth this is a part of her hair and so on and so forth amazing right reversible figures so this is important the first step in localization or maybe the second step in localization is distinguishing what is the figure in the background and that tells you a lot about how to do perception or localizations and this is important for perception now there are certain rules which are followed in this perception or there are certain perceptual organizations which are proposed by gestalt organization uh, gestalt rule which is used for perception or which is used for localization of object in the background now gestalt psychologists focused on how we group objects together because perception or this localization requires not only separating objects from one another but also uh, organizing objects together so that we can view them so we innately look at things in, in groups and not as isolated elements there are certain rules which the gestalt have and these rules are used for perception now one of the rule is called proximity these groups objects that are closer together as being part of the same group the second rule is called similarity which says that objects which are similar in appearance are perceived as being part of the same group similarly we have the third uh, uh, rule which says that objects that form a continuous form are perceived as the same group and we also have a fourth one which is which is called closure like top down processing we fill gaps in it and can recognize it now immediately it will come to your mind that one of the figures that i showed to you the two triangles actually follow the rule of closure and that is why you see the two triangle let's look at what does it really mean this is proximity so when i show you this what do you say i see bunch of lines parallel lines all of these lines are independent of each other but you group them together and this is called simple proximity rule when i ask you what is this you see that you say that i have two group of triangles and one group of circle and this is called the idea of similarity similarly when i so show you this most people will say that it is a curve a complex function curve is not a sine uh, sine uh, curve but it is a cosine curve and when you say that it is wrong because what will happen is this part is different from this part but since they are aligned in a certain manner or uh, it it looks at continuity or it appears to be continuous similarly when i show you this what do you see you see three balls or three dumbbells but they are not three dumbbells these are six different balls which are connected by sticks so the idea of grouping them together is what is gestalt is what gestalt is say is how we make perception or how do we do localization that was of how perceiving objects or grouping objects was but then an amazing thing with the eye is that the eye can not only see two dimensional it can three three dimensional so how does the eye see the third dimension how does the eye perceive the third dimension or the 3d pictures so perceiving distance require depth cues different kind of visual information that logically or mathematically provide information about some objects on depth when you when you see the structure of the eye i said that an object which is in the field will actually be projected onto the retina in a reverse manner but the the object will be in 2d format right because the retina it has only two dimensions a length and a breadth a retina has a length and a breadth how does it create 3d it creates 3d by doing some mathematical and logical calculations so how does the 3d actually come about there are two different kind of cues have you um, ever wondered why do we have only two eyes or why do we have two eyes the reason that we have two eyes is that the two eyes are helpful in making distance right so once you want to see distance once you want to calculate distance one of the cues or one of the uh, things is that a single eye can see distance which is far away so there are certain monocular cues which means that the, these cues are independent and the, any of the eye can actually see it 
right and so how do you see distance you see distance by certain cues or certain information which each eye can actually process or which uh, and these keys uh, cues are actually assumptions so eyes have the certain eyes or independent both the eyes have independent assumptions based on these certain assumptions and fitting these assumptions onto an object which is falling or the information from an object which is falling onto your eye the brain calculates distance how does it do that one of the cues or one of the assumptions is relative size what does it mean if an image contains an array of stimuli objects that differ in size the viewer interprets the smaller object as being further away right so if there are two objects there and so two lamp post and if these lamp posts are in this way that one lamp post looks smaller than the other lamp post people believe or assume that lamp posts are of the same size and that is why they say that the lamp post behind the smaller lamp post is further away than the lamp post which is in front of you Similarly, something called interposition is another assumption. If an object is positioned so that it obstructs the view of other object, the viewer perceives the overlapping object as being nearer to you. So, if there are two objects which are in front of each other and one blocks the view of the other, the one that blocks the view is, is perceived to be nearer to you than the one or uh, object of the, the view of which is being blocked. Similarly, you have something called relative height. Now, among similar objects, those that appear closer to the horizon are perceived to be further away. So, there are diagonal lines inside a, an object and these diagonal lines, when it goes inside an object, that creates a motion of depth, that creates a motion of that depth. And within that, you have, to, if you have two objects and one object appear to be going inside and the other object coming appears to be coming out of the frame, then the relative height tells you that, that there, there is depth or there is some kind of... Uh, 3D in the object or depth in the object. There is something called perspective. What is perspective? When a parallel lines in a scene appear to be converging in the image, these are positioned as vanishing or these are positioned as vanish vanishing. They appear to be perceived as vanishing in the distance and that creates some kind of an image. And lastly, we have something called shadowing and uh, shading. Now, the configuration uh, the, uh, the configuration of shading and shadows provide information about an object and its depth. So, let us look at those uh, things that we saw right now. So, if this is an object, this is a visual image that we have and you can see the four cues or five cues that we have defined. If relative size, so two lamp posts, one here and one here. Now, they are the same size, this appears to be going inside and this is called relative size that tells you depth. This image actually tells you a depth, right? It looks like a market and so in the, within the marketplace there are people. This is called interposition. There are two objects and so this line here drawn in front of this says that this object is in front of it. Similarly, you have perspective. Now, these lines, parallel lines are appear to go inside, right? And converge at some point of time and that tells you that it has depth. And similarly, shading and shadow. If you look into it, there are shadows falling in a certain manner and those shadows actually tell you that there is depth and, there, and that this object is a 3D object. So, perceiving distance requires depth cues, different kind of visual information that logically or mathematically provide information about some object depths. Now, how does the depth cue really work? An experiment was done by someone called Alina Gibson and what her idea was that depth perception uh, or perception of depth actually is embedded in uh, in humans to start with and she created something called a visual cliff experiment. What was it? If you are old enough to crawl, you are old enough to see depth. That is the uh, outline of this experiment. Now, we see depth by using two cues that researchers have put into categories. One is called the monocolor cue and the other is called the binocular cue. So, we will discuss the binocular movement. So, what Elena Gibson's idea was or she designed an experiment which is called the visual cliff experiment. What was the experiment? A small baby like this was put on a visual cliff. Now, this is a hypothetical visual cliff. It is an illusion and there is no depth. You can see, you can see this, this is a depth, but this is not a depth. And so, the child was put on a, 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 a area like this and the child was crawling. Now, it was seen that when the child came near the edge and this edge seems like it is going to fall, the child stopped moving, which basically means that the child did not crawl out of here because he can perceive depth, he can see that I will fall and that is called the visual cliff experiment. So, you see that this is where the cliff is and this is the edge of the cliff, the child is not moving for further. Now, this is an illusion that has been done. This part is an illusion which seems like a depth, but it is not and so the child exactly does not move out or does not come back or does not fall. Now, with the monocolor, so when you are seeing distance, 
one eye is enough. But when you are seeing nearby objects, objects which are coming right at you, you need something called binocular cues. A very good experiment to understand binocular cues is hold your hand in front of your eyes and then clo close one eye. If you close the left eye one, first and then afterwards close the right eye, the hand keeps on moving, the finger keeps on moving. So if I creep my hand like this, creep the uh, uh, then move the right eye, the position is this, but then I move the left eye, it goes somewhere here and so keeps on moving. This is basically because the two eyes are there and these eyes create motion or create depth, depth effect for objects which is nearby to you and that is called the binocular cue. So we need both eyes, both of our eyes to see these binocular cues or motions of objects or actually objects in front of you. Retinal disparity. The experiment that I showed you is called retinal disparity. If I close one eye and see an object which is near to you, if the object is far away, then it will appear similar whether you close the left eye or the right eye. But if an object is right in front of you and if you uh, close one of the eyes, the object keeps on moving and that is called retinal disparity. As an object comes from closer to us, the differences in image between our eyes becomes greater. Convergence. As an object comes closer to our eyes, uh, our eyes have to come together to keep focus on the object. So objects which are two eyes are there because if objects are there in front of you, we need both the eyes. We need images from both the eyes. Also seeing movies. How do we see movies? We need both the eyes because both the eyes create different perspectives and these different perspectives are added together to create the 3D movies that you actually see. There are three dimensions or that there are multiple cameras which are taking it and because you have these two eyes and the binocular cues, you get the 3D vision. And a conversion is one of the things which are there. So if you can see this figure which is in front of you and it is moving, you know, when, when you look at it, the image of this moving in this direction is because of the two eyes. If you had just one eye, we will not be able to see this motion from nearby. As you can see, this person as this is this person is seeing that figure and because of these two eyes which are there and they are converging to each other you can see this motion which is out there now how do we perceive motion there are several the two eyes are responsible for perceiving motion so stroboscopic effect or flip book effect if you take a book and there are several cartoons in which we take a book and then we move the book in a certain way or we just move the pages of the book when we do that, what happens is we create something called artificial motion and that happens because we have binocular cues or two eyes. The five phenomena, what is the five phenomena? You see this object moving in a white space, this red uh, object moving is because of the two eyes or the binocular cues from the two eyes. Do you see the motion here? Now this motion, artificial motion is being done because the two, two eyes is creating this artificial motion or because of the two eyes that is there. Now there is quite an explanation to why this happens but since this is an introductory course, I am not going into the basics of how this motion is created. This is called artificial motion. You would have seen villages or you would have seen uh, certain diagrams or certain lights which actually move in a certain way and creates motion, not only create motion, it creates letters and all kind of things. So this motion that you are seeing is because these lights are actually timed in such a way that that it creates motion. Autokinetic effect. If people stare at a white spot light in a dark room, it appears to move, right? So if this is this object, the movement you are seeing and this is, uh, I mean, in this experiment is not possible, but if assume that it is a dark uh, room and this object is static, it will start moving on itself and that is because of the uh, two eyes that, that is there. So what I will do is, I will stop my lecture here and uh, start with the third process of recognition in the upcoming lecture. So, uh, very quickly I will try and review what we did in this lecture. In this lecture, we tried to look at how, what is perception and how does perception really progress. And then we looked at what is the need of perception for that matter. And we gave up enough information or we gave up enough evidences of why perception is needed for, uh, at, at, at all. From there on, we looked at the five step process that perception starts with and we covered the idea of what is attention and what attention comprises of and what kind of attentions are there and what is the process of attention. Then we looked at the process of localization which is locating an object in the external environment in terms of not only grouping objects together but in terms of also figure ground effect. In relation to that or in addition to that, we actually looked at also how does the eye perceive distance and not only distance, how does the eye manage 
3D images when objects are very closer to you. So we use something called the idea of binocular cues and monocular cues and how these binocular cues and monocular cues not only perceives distances and also objects near to you, it also perceives motion. How does motion is perceived? So we will stop our lecture here and then continue on this in, in the next lecture where we will take up what is recognition, what is constancy and what is abstraction and how they all combine together to form perception. So from here now it is goodbye.